Greetings, everyone. Um, before we begin, we want to remind you that after the broadcast, we're going to be answering all of your questions. Um, so you can submit your questions to us on Facebook, uh, just on the bottom of our most recent post. Um, and then if you have a YouTube account, you can log into YouTube um, and you can chat with us that way. And if you're a teacher and you have any photos of your class tuning in, uh, we would love to see those. So feel free to share them with us uh, at the hashtag, hashtag SnowDesk. 2018. Awesome. Well, welcome everybody who is tuning in to this edition of Snow Desk, the show from the snow in Grand Teton National Park. Woo. My name is Ranger Julie. I'm Ranger Kyle. And we're coming to you live from the town of Moose in Grand Teton National Park, located in the northwest corner of Wyoming. So we're located in that little red star there. And it sounds like we have people tuning in from all over the United States today, including South Dakota, Minnesota, and Florida. So we're super excited to have you all here today. Awesome. Well, it's pretty wintry out here, as you're probably able to see. Uh, you're actually connected with us as we sit behind a desk uh, made of four feet of snow. Yeah, it's real. <laughs> it's real. Um, and it's really cold right now. I think it's about six degrees, uh, which is actually a lot warmer than it was earlier this yeah. morning. Um, but we've been having a relatively mild winter here uh, compared to what we've been having in past years. And I think we have a picture of snow desk from last year when we had twice the amount of snow uh, in the valley uh, where we're broadcasting from that we do now. Mm -hmm. uh, so this year we kind of had to pile up the snow and, and get our ice sculpting skills on to really yeah. carve out this masterpiece of a desk. <laughs> um, but we haven't had the same winter we have uh, where we had last year uh, at all. Um, and, and snow here is really important uh, in, in all of the West, definitely here in Grand Teton National Park, uh, because we don't have a ton of rain mm -hmm. in the summertime like you might if you're tuning in from the east or the southeast. Um, our summers are dry, so we rely on the snow that falls in the mountains behind us. Um, we rely on that snow in the spring and summer when it starts to melt. Uh, it starts to feed our rivers, lakes, and streams, and then people can use it. Uh, we can use it for crops, and, and the animals and plants need it too. So this snow uh, is really important to us here in, uh, in Grand Teton National Park. Yeah, and Grand Teton National Park is just one of the many special places in the United States that have been set aside to be protected forever. And these special places like Rosie the Riveter, World War II, oh, Homefront, National Historic Park, yeah, <laughs> uh, and, and it's a mouthful, as well as Manzanara National Monument uh, and Glacier National Park, and even the Wright brothers have their own uh, national monument there yep. as well. So these have all been set aside to tell the story of all Americans and are important to people all around the world. There are lots of amazing things to explore and discover and learn in these places that have been set aside and protected for you. For them? Yep, yeah, for them. <laughs> <laughs> and that means that this beautiful place will always be here for you to come and visit. But until then, we are really glad that you were able to visit us via Skype today. And our park in particular, Grand Teton National Park, was set aside to protect uh, the beautiful mountains that we have here. I think we have a picture of some of those mountains. Um, our pristine waterways in the park, Snake River, um, Jenny Lake, and a variety of wildlife. Uh, yeah. We have a lot of really special wildlife here that's not found in other parts of the country as well. Um, so this place is incredibly wild, and part of that is because of our extreme seasons. Okay. Um, for example, uh, we're in the middle of a really long winter. And our winters here actually last summer between six and eight months. Oh my goodness, that's so long. Do you even remember what summer was like? No. I, I don't. No. It seems so, so far away. Um, and we hit a lot of snow uh, during our long winters. In fact, we get about 400 inches of snow up in the high mountains. Yeah. Uh, that's as much as a three-story building. Whoa. So, yeah. So if their school was one story, that would be like putting one, two, three, three schools on top of each other. Yeah, a lot of snow. Yeah. Um, but it's not snowy all the time, um, and that snow is going to eventually melt, and it will turn into water. And in today's broadcast of Snow Desk, uh, we're going to be exploring the role of water in Grand T Teton National Park uh, and the water in your hometowns. Yeah, and water, or H2O, can exist in three different ways, or solid, or states of matter. And uh, we 
invite you all to do these hand motions with us uh, as you do them. So loosen up. Uh, water can exist as a solid form, a liquid form, or a gaseous form. And we're lucky here because we have all three states of water in Grand Teton National Park. So cool. Uh, so let's talk about them. Uh, let's start with our first state of water. Uh, our first state we're going to talk about is going to be the solid water. And uh, we have solid water all around us. Uh, snow desk here um, is an example of solid water in the form of snow. Uh, we also have a lot of ice back in the mountains up uh, above us. And um, you may be familiar with uh, water in its solid form, uh, in, in the form of ice, yeah. snow. Uh, a lot of people uh, maybe don't think about permafrost, yeah. uh, glaciers, or polar ice caps are all examples of water in its solid form. And we actually have a field correspondent, I believe, up in the mountains right now. And she's going to talk to us about a special form of solid water that we have here in Grand Teton National Park. So, Ranger Ann, can you hear us? Hi there. My name is Anne, and I'm a park ranger here at Grand Teton National Park. This weekend, I got to ski down my favorite form of frozen water, a glacier. This is one of 11 glaciers we find in the park today. A glacier is a large moving body of ice and snow that takes years and years to form. The weight of the snow and ice creates a lot of pressure and squeezes that ice and snow and makes it move downhill. That's different from regular snow and ice that you might encounter. Glaciers actually flow like a large river of ice. Imagine Silly Putty. Silly Putty is solid, but if you put it on top of a desk, you might see it ooze over the side because gravity is going to pull it down, just like a glacier. Glaciers are really big. They can be at least as big as your school, if not huge. Glaciers are a really important form of solid water because they can shape mountains, melt into cold, clean water, and serve as habitat for animals. One creature that needs glaciers to survive is the western glacier stonefly. Stoneflies are small insects that live in clear, cold water and lay their eggs in mountain streams. So imagine like water that is recently melted from a glacier. In fact, Grand Teton National Park just discovered a new species of stonefly in a stream formed by the melting water from the Middle Teton Glacier. And that stream is icy all year long. We know that stoneflies are very sensitive to water pollution, so having them here is special. Stoneflies tell us that we live in a healthy ecosystem. Furthermore, stoneflies are an important part of the food chain, and they provide sustenance for animals such as our beautiful rosy finch, and they eat the insects that we find in these cold snowy habitats. So imagine if we didn't have glaciers, we wouldn't have these cold mountain streams, and we wouldn't have stoneflies, and they wouldn't serve as food for our beautiful rosy finches. So glaciers are a really important part of frozen water that we find here in Grand Teton National Park. They are my favorite form of wa frozen water, and I hope they're becoming your favorite too. So, please think about, you know, a form of frozen water that you might find in where you live. And think about it for a minute, and then turn to your neighbor and share what you thought of. So, welcome from Grand Teton National Park. I will see you guys later. Goodbye. Thanks, Thanks Ann. Thanks, Ann. Travel safe getting down that mountain there. Now, Green Ann asked you all to think of some solid forms of water near you. So let's take a couple of moments to, to come up with some things. Uh, I might be thinking solid water. I mean, even in places like Florida, you still have ice. You might not be outside. In your freezer. Maybe in your in freezer. Your freezer. Yeah. yeah. You might have ice cubes, ice cream, um, shaved ice. All different forms of ice. Ice cream cake. Ice cream cake. And uh, maybe in Minnesota they have some frozen lakes right now. Uh, so no, yeah. I bet they do. Yeah, those are all great examples of frozen water. So next we're going to talk about liquid water. And this is the most common form of water on Earth. This is the water that we drink or cook with uh, or even shower with. And it could be 
in all different forms like dew or rain or rivers. Uh, in fact, we here have a, a really big river, the Snake River. And right now we have someone standing by to talk to you more about this river. Hey, Ranger Clay, are you there? Hi there, my name is Clay Hanna and I'm one of the rangers here in Grand Teton National Park. And I'm really excited to share with you one of my favorite forms of liquid water here in Grand Teton, and that's the rivers. Now I'm coming to you live from the Snake River, one of the largest rivers in the Western United States. Now we're fortunate here in Grand Teton that the headwaters or the start of the Snake River is just to our north. And that river flows through Grand Teton, through Wyoming, Idaho, Oregon, Washington, and eventually all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Now that's pretty amazing to think about that this water here eventually makes its way all the way to the Pacific Ocean. You know, I've always thought how long that might take. I wonder who I should ask. Maybe I'll just ask the river. River, how long does it take you to get to the Pacific Ocean? Wow, well said, well said. Now surprisingly, the river does not always look like this. When do you think the river flows the fastest? What time of year? Now if you said the spring or the summer, you're absolutely correct. Because during that period, all of this frozen water, this snow that we see, is gonna start to melt. And as that turns from frozen water to liquid water, it's gonna have to flow somewhere. And eventually it makes its way down to the Snake River. But in the winter, this time of the year, the, it can actually get cold enough at night that the river can completely freeze over, which is pretty amazing. Now, no matter what the river looks like, what the water looks like, whether it's frozen or liquid, creatures here in Grand Teton National Park, they depend on the Snake River in order to survive. Creatures like bald eagles, cutthroat trout, moose, beaver, and one of my favorite animals found here in the park, the river otters. Now, river otters are a member of the weasel family, and they've often been described as adorable, playful, and just all around fun. Now, river otters are carnivores, and they'll spend most of their time in and around the water, but they can also be found on the banks of the Snake River. They usually travel in family groups, and they can be seen wrestling on the banks or in the water. And even this time of the year, when there's snow on the banks, they'll make slides that go down into the Snake River, which is really fun. Now, river otters are very sensitive to pollution, which is important for us here in Grand Teton because that allows us to measure the health of the river and the ecosystem. Now, I want you to imagine this pristine river behind me. Imagine if the Snake River were polluted and how that would change the game. Well, it might mean that we don't have river otters, which could change the food web and completely change the ecosystem. So that's just one example of how rivers are an important source of liquid water. Now I want you to take a moment and I want you to think about where you live and all the different sources of liquid water that can be found there. And in just a moment, I'm gonna have you turn to a neighbor and just describe to that neighbor what your favorite form of liquid water is. But before we do that, I'm gonna send it back to the snow desk. <laughs> Thanks, Kyle. I, I can't believe he just tried to interview a river. I know. What do you think it said? Uh, gurgle, 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 gurgle. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I, I thought the interview really flowed though. Yeah. I, yeah. And Clay really went with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Ranger Clay. Um, do, do you have a, a favorite form of, of liquid water here in Grand Teton? I. You know, I really love waterfalls, oh. and there are a lot of waterfalls here in Grand Teton, especially in the spring and early summer. Okay, yeah. nice. Well, we have one more uh, form of water we want to talk about, um, and that's gas or, or water vapor. Mm -hmm. And we find this form of water basically wherever water heats up. Um, so sometimes it's, it's hard to maybe visualize what this form of water looks like mm -hmm. uh, but today is cold and you can see our breath and so our breath <gasps> is actually an example of water vapor yeah. uh, believe it or not and in grand teton uh, we have a really unique form of water vapor here um, 
uh, a, a place where water is warm year round. And I think we have a field correspondent standing by uh, to take us to Kelly Warm Springs. Um, Ranger Megan, are you there? Hi, I'm Ranger Megan. I'm coming to you from Kelly Warm Spring here in Grand Teton National Park. And my favorite form of water is steam or water in the form of gas because it's sneaky and you never know where you're going to find it. In fact, sometimes it's invisible. You can see it a little bit here today. If it looks a little foggy behind me, that's because I'm standing next to a warm spring. It's about 80 degrees year round, so a little, little cooler than your average hot tub. And there's a pocket of magma underneath us that's keeping that steam, that water warm and pushing it out into the warm spring for us. Now there are other animals in the ecosystem that'll take advantage of the steam here. Bison need to bulldoze through that snow with their big head, like a snow plow, to get down to the grasses, the sedges, the forbs. They're herbivores, so they need that stuff. Now if they were over at snow desk, they'd be digging through snow chest high on me. But I just measured the snow over there, and here at Kelly Warm Springs it's only about six inches of snow. So a lot less work for them to get to that lunch. And they're 2,000 pound animals. They need a lot of lunch. So when you come out here, you might find bison wandering around and taking advantage of the warm steam in this area. They're an important part of our ecosystem. Without them, our food chain wouldn't be complete here. So we're really happy about that. They're also really important because this is one of the only places in the world that you can find free roaming bison. Now, that's just one reason why I like steam and water vapor. I want you to think about your home for a second and think about all the places that you might find steam and water vapor. You might have to imagine for a second because it's probably invisible. Once you've thought of it, I want you to turn to your neighbor and share your favorite form of water vapor back home. Snow Desk, back to you. Thanks, Megan. That was an awesome example of gaseous water. Uh, I hope that the students in their classrooms are thinking about different forms of gaseous water near them. Hey, Kyle, what's your favorite form of gaseous water? Uh, I'm going to go with fog. Ooh. I think it's really neat when you're like driving home late at night along a river and it's foggy or maybe when you wake up in the morning. So I think that's a form yeah. people don't really think about a lot. Yeah, that was really cool. What about you? Um, I think some the most common and I think my favorite because I love food is when I'm boiling water for pasta. You got oh, good that, choice. like steam coming up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now I'm hungry. <laughs> now, uh, these forms of uh, water, gaseous water, uh, might be kind of hard, but you can definitely find some places. So let's recap and uh, think about the three ways that water uh, it forms so we talked about solid and liquid water as well as gaseous water but uh, water also travels in different forms as well and it, it goes through three different three different uh, ways through the water cycle the water cycle yeah the water cycle okay and while many people travel to Grand Teton as a vacation destination uh -huh. water in Grand Teton goes on a trip even uh, more spectacular than most of our visitors get to go on and this trip is called the water cycle so here is this really catchy tune to teach you about the water cycle oh. hope you get to sing along I can't wait yeah <laughs> Or the straps of your guitar Water moves about the Tetons you ease It's simple, can't you see? The water cycle, one, two, three Follow along to the tune of this song One, evaporation when the sun comes out Two, water condenses in the clouds Precipitation when the clouds get mighty heavy and the rain it all falls down. Then down our cascades a myriad of waterways brings the rain to our rivers and our streams. Glacial lakes are filled in the way that water will make us jump with joy. Evaporation when the sun comes 
precipitation when the clouds get mighty heavy and the rain it all falls down. Yeah, the rain it all falls down. Wow, I love oh, that song. That was pretty catchy. It's awesome. <laughs> So you might be wondering, where else does water go? If it travels by way of evaporation and condensation and precipitation, uh, where are all those places that water can travel to? We talked about some places in Grand Teton National Park, but where else in the world could we find water? I think that's a great question, Julie. So um, if you have uh, your worksheet, maybe you can do this on your worksheet. If not, you can just think along. And uh, picture a map or a globe in your mind. Um, and, and think about where on this map or on the globe water exists and the different uh, places you might find it. Um, so we're not asking you to say like a specific river, for instance, like the Mississippi River, mm -hmm. but rivers might be an example of where on earth you would find water. Um, so take a minute to think about all the different places on earth that you might find water and, uh, and then maybe we'll go through some of those places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe while they're thinking uh, about these different uh, places where you can find water, uh, we can also think of some questions that they could ask us. So don't forget that you can submit questions to us either uh, at our email, which is grte underscore education at nps.gov, or in our most recent Facebook post. Uh, and we will answer questions there as well as our YouTube uh, page so you can comment there. Yeah, just don't send us your questions in the mail because we won't get them in time. Yeah, that won't yeah. be. <laughs> you can send them in the mail. We'll just have to get back to you later. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, Julie, do you want to go over some of these places on Earth where we might find water? Yeah, let's start off with the biggest place, oceans. Okay. So oceans hold over 96% of Earth's water. and. Wow. That's a lot of water, but the thing is that it's really salty water, so we can't necessarily uh, use that. We yeah. can't necessarily use it, so not usable uh, for people. 97% of yeah, Earth's water. Yeah, that's a lot. Wow. And that, le that means that uh, the rest of the water is found in other places. In other places. So another place you might find water, and we already touched on this one, is in glaciers or snow. So think of the polar ice caps. Um, those actually hold almost 2% of Earth's water. Uh, now, can we access water in the form of ice and snow? Well, it's frozen, so no. Uh, yeah, most yeah. of it, no. Now, we were talking about how Grand Teton relies on the meltwater for mm -hmm. snowpack, so we can access a little bit of that. Um, but a lot of that water that's that's stored in the ice caps or, or bigger glaciers, we're not going to have access to. Yeah, that's true. Now, there is water that is also found right underneath our feet as groundwater or in aquifers. And, and that water is sometimes usable. We're able to uh, take it out of the earth and drink it. Okay. Uh, sometimes it could be really salty too and we can't drink that water. So that one's kind of like a, a yes and maybe and even maybe a no. A no. Okay. Yeah. Um, we also have lakes. Uh, less than 1% of water on earth is found in lakes. Um, can we use water in lakes? Well, yeah, I would say so. Okay. You might have to treat it. Definitely don't go up to a lake and just Dr take a sip, uh, take a sip <laughs> out of that. Uh, but yeah, we can treat that water and use that as our drinking water or even to shower. Uh, now, some place that you might not think of is in the clouds. So we talked about that condensation. That a lot of water is stored up there as well, uh, but we can't access that. Wait, wait, what if I had like a really long cloud straw and I could just... Oh my goodness, it would have to be like at least a mile high. Dude, yeah. That's a really big one. Um, yeah, and when the clouds uh, release that water in the form of rain, it might fall in a river. Rivers, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So rivers are another place, and I think we already mentioned rivers earlier, mm -hmm. um, Ranger Clay. Uh, but, yeah. but rivers are another place uh, that stores water. Um, and they're really important because we do get a lot of water for drinking and for agriculture, for our farms and our food uh, from rivers. Yeah. So that's another good one. 
Yeah, and get this. There's water in us. In us? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, both plants and animals uh, and humans have water inside of them. So there's some water stored in there too. I can probably bet not many people out there got that one. That's pretty tricky. Yeah, that and then the last one I was thinking about was soil. There's actually a tiny fraction of water on the planet that's stored in our soil, which isn't really accessible to us, but it's mm -hmm. probably important to, uh, to forests yeah. and, and, and to animals, right? So this is a, a good representation of, of where our water is, where we can find it on Earth. Mm -hmm. um, you can see this pie chart. And that's showing us that the vast majority of water, like we said, is stored in oceans of about 97%, mm -hmm. and we can't use that water. So the water that we do have available for use, that fresh water, is just not very much of it. Yeah, it's, there's not very much water. And um, this is really important because will Earth ever get more water? No. Yeah, the answer is no. Yeah, this is all we have. Yeah, the water that we have now, even though uh, it goes through that water cycle and it moves from place to place, th that's the only water that we have. Oh, this so, is making me like really sad about snow desk. Like, yeah. it's very, it's a valuable thing. Yeah, we got to cherish it. Yes, cherish forever. It. So, yeah, what do you think we should do about the water that we have now? I think we need to work on ways we can save it and take care of it. Um, uh, keeping it clean and, and just not wasting it. Um, so, uh, we think we have a video of a way that maybe some of you could think about working to save uh, water. And we have some, some ranger actors in yeah. this video who are, are pretty proud of their performance. So, yeah, I can't wait to share this. Yeah, with maybe you let's cut to the video. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm becoming so silly. You know, we don't actually sleep in the visitor center. <laughs> <laughs> and and if you did, you'd probably want like a real sink to brush your teeth in. Yes. And not the, the blue drugs. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Well, um, that was pretty impressive. Uh, the ranger who was just kind of wasting water and not turning it off when she brushed her teeth uh, wasted three gallons of water Whoa. in one toothbrushing session. That's so much water. Yeah, so that'd be like wasting six gallons of water a day. Wait a minute, why six? Uh, because you brush your teeth two times a day, Julie. Oh, 
Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so let's do a little math. Um, and, and maybe if you're a class out there, you can you can play along. Um, let's say a class of students has 25 students in the class. And let's say you are all water wasters, uh, like Ranger Doria out there. Oh, no. Yeah. And so you wasted six gallons a day. Uh, or you, yeah. You used, wasted six, wasted six yeah. gallons a day. Uh -huh. Right. Um, and there were 25 students in the class. That would be six times 25, um, which means that would be 150 gallons a day that you could save Whoa. by turning off your faucet. Yeah, so instead of wasting that water, they can turn off the faucet and save 150 gallons a day. Wow. And if they cut that up for um, a week, they would save a thousand and 50 gallons a week. And for a month, they could do that for 4,200 gallons uh, in, in that month. And if they were to continue this for a whole year, they could save up to 50,400 gallons in that year. And that's just one hypothetical classroom. Can you uh, imagine all the classrooms that are watching us right now, Kyle, if they were to also turn off their faucets when they brush their it's teeth? It's just saving so much of our so precious water. water. That yeah. would be such a big deal. And if they were to tell maybe another classroom or their friends uh, or their family, they can get so many people to save that water. Um, and there and that's just one way to save water there are so many other ways that's awesome yeah. so so far we've been talking a lot about the water here in grand teton and and you know we have a pretty good amount of snow this winter um and you know we have a decent amount of water here as a result of all that snow which is good but there's other places in the country uh, that are a lot drier and just don't have that much water so it's really important to protect it uh, I'm thinking of like Death Valley uh, in California, a uh, place that is naturally dry. And then there are also places um, that have been getting a lot more water recently than maybe they're used to getting historically. Um, thinking back to the floods earlier this year uh, in Houston, yeah, uh, all that rain. Um, I know we've had some record snowstorms in the Northeast this year. Mm -hmm. um, so just because you live in a place where there's a lot of water, I, I think it, you can still uh, be aware of how much water you're saving because there are dry places uh, that could probably use that water um, in, in the future. We also, uh, I think we have an image here of a uh, snowpack in the Western United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see all those little dots and those dots are, are, are different colors and they represent the amount of snowfall and the water in that snow that has fallen this year. And a neat trend you can see is that there's a lot of red dots and a lot of uh, orange dots in the West. And these colors, red and orange, represent areas that are experiencing below average snowfall. And that's a lot of the West this year, just hasn't had a lot of snow. Um, so I'm seeing California, Arizona, New Mexico, mm -hmm. Utah. Colorado. All, yeah, yeah. All really below average. Julie, do you see, uh, are there any blue dots on that map? Oh yeah, so the, the white, blue, the greens, those are places that are getting the above average snowfall. And, uh, ooh, we have places like Montana and Wyoming. Um, that are getting uh, like kind of at or above average snowfall. Right, like where we are now. And mm -hmm. this is so important for a lot of places in the West because if they don't get that snowfall, mm -hmm. we don't have that water that we've been talking about. And when we don't have that water in the spring and summer, we can really dry out and we can yeah. experience big droughts and, and potentially really bad fire conditions mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So it's a, it's a pretty big deal. Yeah, that's true. And uh, we encourage you all to find out what's happening in your region. If your area is getting drier, it will be important to save water. But also, if your hometown is getting wetter, it is still important to save water so it can move to other dry areas right. through the water cycle. And we're lucky here in Grand Teton National Park uh, because if we wanted to drink water from the tap, we can. We can just turn it on and sip it. And not only is it uh, delicious, and refreshing, but it's also clean. And part of that is because of our snowpack. So our mountains act like a storage area, like a savings account uh, for our water. And eventually in, uh, in the summer, as it gets warmer, that water comes down and trickles down as waterfalls and streams and eventually into the river in our taps. 
Um, but uh, not everyone is so lucky. You can probably think of places around the United States and even around the world where there are people who don't have access to clean drinking water. I mean, the, there's a uh, South uh, Afri Africa, Cape Town, is running out of water uh, yeah. within the next couple of months. So, so they not, might need some of that water that we're saving, that we're you saving. Know, in places like here. Yeah, that's true. And so that's why it's important to encourage your friends and neighbors to take care of their water. So teach one person one way to save water. Now we talked about how much water you can save by turning off the faucet when you're brushing your teeth. Uh, but there are so many other ways that you could save water. And then if you tell one person to tell another person and they tell another person and so on and so forth, eventually we'll have everyone saving water. I think that's such a good idea. And it sounds like a really big job. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's going to take a lot of work. Uh, so let's recap really quick what yeah. we've been talking about today. Um, so we learned that the world has one supply of water. And that supply of water is really finite. We're not going to get any more. So we need to take care of the water that we have. Um, and the water that we have can exist in three ways. It can exist in the solid form. It can exist in liquid form and in gaseous form. And water moves around in a cycle. Um, it moves up uh, by evaporation, condensation in the clouds, and then comes down in precipitation in the form of rain or in snow. Um, so, great job. Yeah, and water that we have in Grand Teton National Park might end up as your drinking water someday, or the other way around. The water that you have around you might end up in Grand Teton National Park as glaciers or rivers, or maybe even steam. Uh, and that's why it's important why we have to take care of water because not only uh, does that save our water but it also takes care of our wildlife and protecting water and the wildlife and the park is a pretty big job for us park rangers and even though we work really hard sometimes that hard work is just not enough and we need all the help we can get and we think it's up to our, the owners of the National Park Service uh, to help protect them. Hey, Kyle, I wonder if they know who the owners of National yeah, Parks why are. Yeah, don't, if, if, you're, if you're watching, why don't you point at someone who you think owns a national park? Yeah, just, just go ahead and point, point at someone. Let's see. You know, our friends all over the United States are probably pointing at us because uh -huh. we, we makes sense we work live here. and work here yeah right. um, but they might also be pointing at their teachers at their friends uh, at themselves <laughs> and yeah all of those are true because you all own the national parks uh, they belong to everyone not only you but your friends your family your teachers your neighbors and get this Kyle it belongs to their kids. Their kids, but a lot of the people watching us are in like fourth grade. I know that they are still they don't have kids, kids themselves, but one day if they choose to have kids, uh, they will also be owners of the national parks. Oh, wild! Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and their kids, and their kids' kids, and their kids' kids' kids will all be owners of the national parks. So it's essentially up to everyone to help protect these national parks so that we can have them for not only the present but also for future generations that's so cool julie so yeah. it's up to all of you uh to to get out there and protect them and we challenge you to learn more about national parks um and just wild places all over this country um visit uh, the surrounding national park sites uh where you live um they're all over take a field trip explore uh, you can even become a junior ranger which i think is something Whoa, that we both yeah. did um <laughs> go in and find your park and I think we'll conclude with uh, the words of a Dr. Seuss character, one of my personal favorites, the Lorax. Oh, yeah. And uh, the, the Lorax says something that I think is very profound. The Lorax says, um, unless, unless someone, someone like, like you cares a whole awful, awful lot, lot, nothing, nothing is, is going, going to get, get better. better. It's no. not. So we hope that you all care a whole awful lot, not only about Grand Teton National Park, but other national parks near you. And there are so many to, uh, to visit and to learn from, over 400 sites. Uh, so thank you so much. There, you can see there are so many places around the United States, and we encourage you to find one near you.
Uh, they're, they range from national uh, parks to national monuments to national seashores and uh, uh, rivers and so many more. So it definitely takes the time to do that. Uh, so thank you so much for tuning in. It looks like we have some time for questions. Don't forget that uh, if you have some questions, you can post them on our most recent Facebook post on the YouTube uh, page that you're viewing this on or on uh, our emails. No carrier pigeons. No carrier pigeons. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Or uh, telepathic messages. <laughs> we, we won't get those either. I think our first question is, what's the record low here in Grand Teton? Yeah. I think it's uh, negative 63 degrees is the record low um, from back in the 30s or the 40s. Mm -hmm. So we haven't had temperatures that cold for a long time, but it can get really cold. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and not only does it get really cold here, but uh, we also get a lot of snow. And currently in the valley, we get uh, we have about uh, 18 inches to about 24 inches of snow. Uh, I think one of our classes viewing wanted to know how deep the snow is. And it, up in the mountains, it's about 300 inches deep right now. Uh, so that's pretty impressive. Yeah, that's the cumulative amount oh, we've yeah, had all yeah, year. Is three, yeah, there's 300 inches. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh. You want to yeah. take this one? Yeah, so the question was, how many animals do we have? So uh, if you're asking how many species of animals we have, uh, we have over 60 species of mammals, wow. including grizzly bears and bison uh, and wolves and elk and even smaller mammals like pikas and marmots. Uh, we also have over 300 species of birds that call Grand Teton home either in the summer or in the winter because they will migrate uh, or some will stay all year round. We also have about um, 17 species of fish here uh, that call our lakes and rivers home. And if you're thinking about insects, we have so many. It's hard to count. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know how many species of insects. I think one, one thing that's really important about the animals we have here is we have animals here that we don't have in other parts of the country. Uh, the animals we have here have always existed in Grand Teton National <laughs> Park, basically like since the end of the last ice age. So, yeah. you know, we have grizzly bears and we have wolves and we have bison, um, animals that have been eliminated in other parts of the country mm -hmm. that are still here. So I think that's what makes this place really special to me. Yeah, that's true. It's quite the opportunity. Okay. Oh, so this question is coming from... Uh, okay, so these questions are coming to us from a school in, uh, in a near Missis the Mississippi River. Uh, so thank you for, for asking us these questions. And uh, it was... Do, do, it was, do lakes and rivers freeze? Yeah, do lakes and rivers freeze? So here in Grand Teton, our lakes definitely freeze. Uh, lake, even the larger, one, larger ones like Jackson Lake and um, Jenny Lake, those are all frozen right now. And that's, there's a great picture showing you uh, the lake starting to freeze over in the beginning of the winter. Uh, in our river, it is fast flowing, so it doesn't normally freeze, but there are sections of the river that will freeze over, like uh, Oxbow Bend, and this is a, a really good place to, to go out and see some wildlife there. Uh, so we do have places on the river that will freeze during the winter. Yep. The oh. question is, is there any trouble with flooding? Mm -hmm. And yeah, so at this time of year, uh, there's not going to be, because just like Julie said, mm -hmm. most of the rivers are frozen um, and, and the river level is low. But what's going to happen in the springtime when all this snow starts to melt 
is all the snow is going to rush into our rivers and we do get big floods here so mm -hmm. for instance we have a river in grand teton national park called the gravant river mm -hmm. and the gravant river had a huge flood last spring um we had a historic snow melt and it blew out uh one bridge and then it blew out a road um that was you know destroyed for half of the summer so we have floods here uh just like probably you do you know wherever you're watching from yeah yeah that's a good question oh so the question is what kind of birds are in the park so i as i mentioned there are over 300 different species and my favorite bird that we get to see a lot in the winter is the bald eagle. It will fly over the Snake River often, and, uh, and, you, and you can see them. Sometimes they'll even go in and just dive in and come out with a fish. Well, that's a really neat find. Uh, what other fish? Can, or, uh, yeah, I think that's such an interesting question. Of? Birds are, are one of my favorite things to, to see here. I would say about 75% of the birds that spend time here leave during the winter time. Mm -hmm. So we get way more birds in the summertime. There's not very many species that are able to resist and stick it out. Yeah. And so the ones that do, I think, are really cool to me. Um, we have a lot of ravens here in Jackson Hole. Oh, yeah. And ravens are one of my favorite birds here. Um, another cool thing about ravens is, is they're pretty intelligent. And when there's a carcass, when an animal dies, they're some of the first birds to converge onto that carcass. Mm -hmm. And so you can, you know, really, if you see a flock of ravens, oftentimes they're converging on a dead animal. Oh, there's a great oh, example yeah. there with the bald eagle in it. Yeah, it's kind of like the telltale sign that uh, something has died over there because they right. will be swarming. And then if you're really lucky, you might see, you know, a pack of wolves or some coyotes mm -hmm. on that carcass too. So sometimes you can look for ravens for signs of, of other animals or just signs of what's going on. Uh, in the park when it comes to, to wildlife interactions, which is really neat. Yeah. Awesome question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. So uh, how do we keep the pipes from freezing in the winter? Uh, you know, once the, the snowpack starts to pile up uh, along our houses, it kind of acts like an insulator. Uh, so we, we really count on that snow to pile up. Uh, we also sometimes will, uh, uh, <laughs> so yeah, we'll also sometimes uh, keep our temperature, our houses kind of warm, and uh, and that helps a lot too. Right, or we yeah. just like won't use it during the winter time. Yeah, that's you know, true. Yeah, a lot of our summer building. uh, buildings are, are, shut, are winterized is what we call it, uh, so they're shut down. Oh, question is how often do avalanches occur in the park? That really depends on snow conditions, but because we have such steep mountains and so much snow, mm -hmm. uh, we have avalanche risk uh, really like all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, there's really never a time when it's probably going to be you know, a time when we don't have to ever worry about an avalanche. I should say that we're down here in the valley, so mm -hmm. we're not at risk of being in an avalanche here. But if we were to put on backcountry skis and venture back up in the mountains to get some powder turns in, right? Yeah. <laughs> we would have to be aware of avalanches. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, because we haven't had a ton of new snow uh, in the last couple days, that snowpack's probably starting to stabilize just a bit. It's remained cold. Those are pretty uh, safe conditions for avalanches. But say a big storm were to come in overnight, dump a lot of snow, and start to create big avalanche slabs, we might have to be more concerned if we were going in, in the backcountry to do some skiing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And th here's an example. Yeah, we have had some really big ones. I think mm -hmm. early early this year, uh, there were a couple huge ones. Oh, so the question is, how long has Grand Teton been open? So we have uh, uh, been a park since 1929. Now, uh, when uh, when Grand Teton was uh, first starting, it was only protecting the mountain range. So everything else in the valley was not protected. And it wasn't until 1950 that that part of, of the park joined the rest. And so now we have over 300,000 acres 
in the park that is protected. So uh, you could say our birthday is 1929, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot of birthdays. Yeah, we, like we have a lot of birthdays. <laughs> uh, and we're uh, definitely not that old, so... <laughs> The tallest yeah. mountain is Snow Desk. <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding. No. Yeah. So uh, the tallest mountain is Grand Teton, uh, and it is 13,770 feet tall. So uh, that is 13,770 feet above sea level. So for those of you who are coming in uh, from those areas, uh, like in Florida and California that are in sea level, uh, that's, a, that's a huge difference. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really high. And so the next picture we're going to show you isn't going to be a live picture. Uh, there it is. There's a picture of the Grand. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of covered in the clouds right now, um, or in water vapor, I should yeah. say. Uh, but yeah, here's a great picture um, of the Grand, maybe in the summertime. Yeah, and it holds. The amazing thing about our mountains is they're so tall; they hold snow all year. So yeah. you can visit in August, and you can look way up and see into the snow. And you if you were gonna go hiking there. up there, you could hike into the snow during the summertime, which is pretty wild. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the question is, where do animals go in the winter? So uh, Kyle mentioned how some of our bird species will migrate or leave Grand Teton, uh, but we also have some animals that stay here and, uh, and tough it out. Animals like the elk uh, that will stay in the region, uh, bison and wolves, uh, yeah. Any, any other things uh, that you would like to add? I guess only to that, uh, bears. Some animals hibernate. Yeah. Some animals can hibernate, they can, they can leave, or they can resist, like mm -hmm. you were saying. And yeah. Bears are our famous hibernators. And tough it out. All yeah. right. So I, I think that we actually need to wrap it up here. Um, but thank you all so much for tuning in. If you have additional questions, you can, uh, keep commenting on our Facebook thread. Uh, you can send us an email. Um, or you could even give us a call. Um, but it's been so fun to get to hang out with all of you today. And uh, we hope you, hope you learned something about water. Yeah, and hopefully one day you'll get to come out here in person and visit us soon. Turn off the faucet when you brush your teeth. Don't forget, save that water. <laughs> all right. Bye. Bye. <laughs>